The Gospel of Mark is a book in the Bible about the life of Jesus. And the earliest reliable tradition tells us that it was written by a guy named John Mark. Now Mark didn't just grab a bunch of random stories about Jesus and throw them together. He's designed this book to address some really specific questions about whether or not Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. So let's stop right there because that's a term a lot of people like me aren't very familiar with. Yeah, so the Messiah was a royal figure, sometimes called the Son of God, that Israel was expecting to come and set up a kingdom here on earth. And around the time of Jesus, Israel was occupied by Rome, and so many Jews were hoping that the Messiah would come and overthrow the Romans and rule as king. But Jesus didn't overthrow the Romans. In fact, he was killed by them. And that brings us to the very issues Mark is trying to get at in this book. So in the first half, he focuses on who Jesus is. Is he really the Messiah? And then in the second half, he's addressing how Jesus became the Messianic King. And then right here in the middle of the book is this pivotal story that brings the two halves together and Jesus answers both of these questions. Okay, so let's talk about the first half of the book, who Jesus is. So Mark makes his beliefs about Jesus very clear from the first line of the book. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. One of the next stories is Jesus getting baptized and God's voice announces from heaven, this is my son. So it couldn't be more clear, it's presenting Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, but as you're reading through this first half of Mark, you'll notice something really interesting start to happen. Jesus is going about healing all these different people, and he's constantly telling them to keep quiet about who he is. This happens so many times in Mark's account, it's very strange. Yeah, why keep it a secret? So remember, lots of Jews had lots of different expectations about what the Messiah would be and do. And so Jesus doesn't want people to misunderstand what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah. It's always exciting to start a brand new study. And we are beginning a study in the book of Mark that we're going to go for 10 weeks and walk through the story of Jesus. In many ways, the Gospels are the heart of what we believe. This is the heart of the Bible because you'll notice that the message title is Centrality of Jesus. It's really all about Jesus. And if he is who he says he is, and if he did what he said he did, then it changes everything. And so we go back and we're going to kind of, again, look at these important verses. I want to start just by reading chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Why, Why are we studying this? Why are we reading it? Why are we going through it? It's because we want to know again and again that Jesus is the center of everything. And so... Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, I hope this will be a challenge and an encouragement. And we're going to give you, to begin with, a little bit of background. Who is this book written by, and how come we have four Gospels? And let's talk about some of the context, and then we'll dive into the first chapter of the book of Mark. So, the author is a guy named John Mark. Now, it seems like every other person, every other guy in the New Testament is named John, and every other woman's named Mary. So you have to kind of pay attention about which ones we're talking about. And this is John Mark, and we know a little bit about him. It's not like you you can read a place where you get a paragraph about him unless you have a study Bible and it gives you at the beginning of the book. So we have to glean little pieces about his life from various mentions in Scripture. And one of the things we know is he related to a guy named Barnabas. He's probably a cousin of Barnabas's. And Barnabas was one of those very important uh, figures in the early church. He wasn't one of the 12 apostles, but he's first mentioned when he sells some land and he brings it because there's people in the church that, that are literally not meeting their food bill. They can't eat. And so he's, he's no, seen there as being generous and caring. And then we see him again when he encourages and is a sponsor for this wild guy named Saul who used to be killing Christians and now he's preaching Jesus. And so you see Barnabas through various places in the scripture. And we also know that John Mark's mom lived in Jerusalem. So we assume John Mark uh, grew up in Jerusalem. He probably heard of Jesus. Maybe he even heard him teach, saw some of his miracles. And we know that his, his house was in Jerusalem because in Acts, when Peter gets thrown in jail, they have a prayer meeting. Guess where the prayer meeting is? It's at Mary's house or John Mark's house. 
And so he grew up there, and it, his, her house became obviously a very important center of the early church. That was where they met when they were praying for Peter. So they, they were, she was an early believer. Uh, it's possible that John Mark had a mixed heritage, like Timothy did, because his name John is very Hebrew, but Mark is very Roman. And so it's possible that he has a Jewish mom who's named Mary, and we don't know who his father is, but there may have been an influence there. So that's a little bit about his family circle. And then you see the big moment in his life when cousin Barnabas is traveling with the apostle Paul, and they go on a big missionary journey, and they teach the, about Jesus and plant a bunch of churches. And when they're getting ready to go again, Barnabas says, let's take my cousin. Let's let it, have him go with us. And so Mark goes with Paul. Well, he leaves in chapter 12 to go on the journey, and he comes back home in chapter 13 of the book of Acts. And we don't know why. Maybe he was homesick. Maybe he was allergic to all the rocks that were thrown when the Apostle Paul was around, the riots that went on. And Paul's word is, he deserted us. So next time they wanted to make a missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas again match up to go, and Barnabas says, let's bring Mark again. I think of Barnabas as the guy that gives second chances. He's the guy that gives a lot of grace. He's the son of encouragement is his nickname. And, and so he says, let's go take Mark again. And Paul says, nothing doing. He's a quitter. Can't be on my team. And so they split at that point. And Barnabas takes Mark and Paul takes Silas. And they go in separate ways. And later on in 2 Timothy 4, Paul acknowledges that Mark has become very valuable to him. And so he sees the journey. And so you see the ups and downs of Mark's life. We also know from church tradition that he was associated with Peter. And there is an early church father that says what Mark did was he took notes on Peter's messages. Did I mention that part about taking notes being a good idea? So he had evidently listened to Peter, taken notes. He had perhaps seen some of this himself. But Mark wasn't one of the apostles, but he's writing the very first gospel, we think, the first story that came out to get down all these things we know about Jesus so that people would have it documented and so that they would believe that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. So that's a little bit about Mark. Now, if you look across the right side of your notes, there's a little chart there I want to fill in because I think this is an important thing to understand. And some of this is kind of Bible School 101, and you may be familiar with it, or that may be brand new to you. If people start reading the New Testament, they read the book of Matthew. Then they get to the book of Mark, and it's like, wait a minute, I've already read this. Then they do the book of Luke, and it's like, uh, again? Is that all the New Testament is, is stories about Jesus? But no, we have four stories about the life of Jesus. And you will encounter some places where the stories aren't exactly the same. One mentions two guys, another one mentions one guy, and there are various details that are different. And some people have used that to say, see, they're not really the truth. These are not really inspired. But you know, if you are a detective, and you take in some suspects from a crime scene, and they all tell you exactly the same story, what do you know? You know they're lying, because they rehearsed it. They're making it up. They had gone through, it's called collusion. If they tell you essentially the same story with differing details, it means that they were witnesses. In fact, even if you have people giving witness at, a, at a, an accident site or something, people tell it differently. And so we often get a fuller story by comparing the Gospels with each other, which is really helpful, especially since Mark is very brief. Uh, Mark is the cliff notes on Jesus. He just gives you the bare details. But... The other reasons are that we also have different authors who are really trying to reach different audiences, so they speak with a different style. Not only does the author have a different viewpoint, but they have a different purpose. And so let me just run through this briefly. Matthew, and we will meet him next week, his name is, other name is Levi, and he is orienting his story to the Jewish people who need to see Jesus as their Messiah, which means that Matthew is full of Old Testament quotes because that's what they're familiar with. And he's proving that he was the promised Messiah. 
And he presents Jesus as the king of the Jews, as the Messiah, the royal figure who was to come. So Mark, on the other hand, the first couple of verses are from the Old Testament. Other than that, he doesn't ever mention the Old Testament because he's writing to Gentiles. And they don't know anything about the Old Testament. It's like if I quote some author you've never heard of. It's not going to be very compelling to you. And he really focuses on Jesus as the active servant, the hands of God that's going out. And, and the book of Mark is full of, he did this and he did this. And he went here, and one of the key words is immediately. <laughs> it's like everything is on high speed. And then you look at Luke, and Luke is a doctor. And he goes back, and he's very detailed. He gives us a lot of things about uh, people's, uh, the diseases that Jesus healed them from. And also... He was commissioned by a guy named Theophilus. He was given money to go back and to do research so that the story is chronological and complete. So he is very, very careful about the order of things. And he gives us all kinds of details. But he's also presenting to the Greeks, to the intellectuals of the day, that Jesus is the ideal man, that he's the perfect man. Yes, he's fully God, but he is also fully human. So in the book of Luke, you have a hundred verses about John the Baptist and how he was announced and the announcement to Mary and the birth narratives. If you ever want to read for Christmas, it's almost always in Luke because he goes back and he, he talks about Jesus who is created like to be like us. And then the book of John, I think, is written mostly to believers who are tempted by persecution to go back into Judaism. And he uses beautiful word pictures. There's seven I am's where Jesus said, I am the bread of life, I am the living water, I am the good shepherd. He, he paints these elaborate word pictures and then he shows it with stories. He doesn't care anything about chronology. He puts things at the beginning and the end. It doesn't matter to him. Why is that important? Whereas Luke goes through. So if we ever try to figure out the timeline, we always go to Luke. Now, it's an interesting thing. Matthew and Luke both have long genealogies. Matthew's genealogy goes back and it takes it to Abraham. He's the king of the Jewish people and he takes his chronology all the way back there. When, when you talk about Luke, he goes all the way back and he goes to Adam. He was the, perfect, he was the first man and Jesus is the second Adam. So when you're reading these, not only compare to get the details, you also need to understand there's a, a particular point of view, a particular way in which they're trying to present the story of Jesus so that it is both true, but also so that it is particularly compelling to the audience that he is trying to address. Uh, I think Luke is uh, a very popular gospel today because it is sort of like our mindset, that intellectual Greek mindset is often what people are coming to today. So I hope that helps you as you're reading the Gospels and as you are looking even through the book of Mark, you'll see evidences of it. Boy, he leaves a lot out. In fact, when we're telling some of the stories in the book of Mark, we're going to have to go to Matthew and Luke and fill in some of the details because Mark just gives you the cliff notes. Here's what happened. Here's the proof that Jesus is who he said he is. So let's jump right in to understand more about this with a little video. Mark is a book in the about Bible Mark. about the life of Jesus. And the earliest reliable tradition tells us that it was written by a guy named John Mark. Now, Mark didn't just grab a bunch of random stories about Jesus and throw them together. He's designed this book to address some really specific questions about whether or not Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. So let's stop right there because that's a term a lot of people like me aren't very familiar with. Yeah, so the Messiah was a royal figure, sometimes called the Son of God, that Israel was expecting to come and set up a kingdom here on earth. And around the time of Jesus, Israel was occupied by Rome, and so many Jews were hoping that the Messiah would come and overthrow the Romans and rule as king. But Jesus didn't overthrow the Romans. In fact, he was killed by them. And that brings us to the very issues Mark is trying to get at in this book. So in the first half, he focuses on who Jesus is. Is he really the Messiah? And then in the second half, he's addressing how Jesus became the Messianic King. And then right here in the middle of the book is this pivotal story that brings the two halves together and Jesus answers both of these questions. Okay, so let's talk about the first half of the book, who Jesus is. 
So Mark makes his beliefs about Jesus very clear from the first line of the book. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. One of the next stories is Jesus getting baptized and God's voice announces from heaven, this is my son. So it couldn't be more clear, it's presenting Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, but as you're reading through this first half of Mark, you'll notice something really interesting start to happen. Jesus is going about healing all these different people and he's constantly telling them to keep quiet about who he is. This happens so many times in Mark's account, it's very strange. Yeah, why keep it a secret? So remember, lots of Jews had lots of different expectations about what the Messiah would be and do. And so Jesus doesn't want people to misunderstand what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah. So as to the question about why Jesus tells people not to tell, we'll talk about that next week. I hope as you walk through this story with me that it's going to reinforce again that Jesus is who he said he is and that my response needs to be to follow him. We've asked that question, who do you follow? And it's easy for us to follow our own inclinations, to follow the culture of the day, to follow a great leader, to follow whatever we feel like at the moment. And the life that we want is the life that's following Jesus more and more and more faithfully. And so as we look through it, let's not only see who Jesus is, let's see how does that mean that I should follow him. And so in the beginning here, we are looking at Jesus who is opening his campaign. So for 30 years, after all the birth narratives and the, the moving from Bethlehem to Egypt and then back up to Nazareth, Basically, he just grows up and is a normal guy for 30 years. I don't, I don't mean that he wasn't the son of God. I mean that he lived a quiet life in Nazareth. Um, we often talk about him as a carpenter. Did you realize that most people think it's more likely he was a stonemason? And uh, we've been to Israel several times. There's a whole lot more call for stonemasons than there is for carpenters because everything's stone. And uh, it's the same word. And he probably just lived in... Nazareth worked in a little town called Sepphoris, and for 30 years, he grew up there. And now he's the beginning of his public ministry, his campaign to present himself as the Messiah that Israel has been waiting for. And so we're going to start with the first verses of the book of Mark and read through this story about the validation for who Jesus is. The beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So Mark's first point, and his only real point about the Old Testament, is that before the Messiah was to come, there was prophesied one who would come who would be the forerunner or the one who would come ahead, the one who would prepare the way. And he then jumps into a discussion of how John the Baptist perfectly fits that bill. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So here's an interesting point about how the Gospels are different. In the book of Luke, we get the story of an angel appearing to Zechariah, who's John the Baptist's father. And they are barren, have been all of their life. Never, he and his wife were never able to have children. Now they're old. And when the angel says, you're going to have a son, he's like, how do I know this is true? I'm from Missouri. I don't believe you. And... And the angel says, shut up, you're not going to talk till this boy's born, and then you'll know. And there's all this story about how John is called from the time he was, before he was born, and even in Elizabeth's womb, he leaps when he sees Mary, who is going to bear Jesus. And so there's this incredible backstory. And what does Mark say? Suddenly he appeared. That's what I mean. He just talks about, let's cut to the chase. If you like a, a gospel that doesn't give you any details, just cuts to the chase, Mark's your man. And then he says he was doing a baptism in the Jordan River, and this was for repentance. Now, you understand that this was a very religious country, but it was also a country that was torn by being 
under the heel of Rome and there was all kinds of, of death and starvation and all kinds of things going on. And what John was trying to do was to take religious people who were focused on their own righteousness and have them get a soft and humble heart to admit how messed up they were. You see, Jesus continually had trouble with the hard-hearted religious people. And John was, I think of it, if you think of a gardener, it's like, he's like the plow that goes through, that tears up the dirt so that the good seed can go in. And he is a rough guy, and he is preaching, and it says all the Judean countryside came out to see him. So there was a, a mass response to his message, and they asked to be baptized, and that baptism was because they were confessing their sins, and they wanted to repent. They, they had a change of mind to turn from the way they were going and turn back and follow God. And so John was preparing the way. And then it says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, which seems to me funny details for Mark to include. And what he's emphasizing, I think, is John the Baptist was rough. He wasn't the kind of polished religious ruler that had all the fancy clothes and big houses. This guy was rough, and he was strong in his language, and he was a, a plow tearing up the ground. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Locusts are edible. And actually, they're like 65% protein. But the point, it says he, ate, he didn't drink anything having to do with grape juice or wine, and he didn't eat any bread. He, he lived a very ascetic lifestyle, a very self-disciplined lifestyle. And this was his message, not only to repent, but after me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. So he was literally preparing a way. He said, I want you to get baptized. I want you to have a change of heart about your sinful hard heart. But that's not the end. The end is that there is one coming, and I am announcing him. And then he says, I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That I am doing a preparatory work when the Son of, Man, when the Son of God comes. He will prepare you by the, the Holy Spirit. So John is out there in the wilderness. He is speaking in a rough, strong manner. And in fact, there's a contrast between John the Baptist and Jesus. Uh, it says that John came neither eating or drinking, and you said he was crazy. And the Son of Man came both eating and drinking, and you say he has an evil spirit. And the point was, is they had the same message in different styles. I think that's an important thing to hear. Churches don't all have to do exactly the same thing. We don't always have to exactly same gifts. We don't all have the same style, as long as we have the same message. And in fact, Jesus said, if you had listened to John, then you would believe me. And when the Pharisees later came and said, by what authority do you do these miracles? He said, let me ask you a question first. By what authority did John do his miracle or do his baptism? And they didn't want to answer him because they had refused the first message, so they missed the second message. You see, a hardened heart resists the truth. And I find that when people finally come to faith, they usually look back and they say, you know, I see that God has been trying to reach me for years, but I've been ignoring him. And I think this is a picture of that. So John was the forerunner. Literally in those days, the king would have somebody run ahead of him and yell, make way for the king so that you could give him the right honor and prepare the way. And John was the one that was making the path straight. He was cutting out the obstacles that were there. So what do we learn from this for ourselves except that this is a wonderful historical part and that it is a validating factor for Jesus? Well, I was thinking of that idea of forerunner. John was a forerunner for Jesus. You and I are forerunners also. You see that God has sent you into the family he's sent you into. He's put you in the school you're supposed to be in. He's given you a neighborhood. He's given you a job. He, he's put you a place where you are to be a light to the people that you are around. You see, it's rare that we will get people who don't know anything about Jesus to come and sit in church. 
the, the actual first plan is that the people who know Jesus, who are the light of the world, we are to go out into the world. And I want you to think about the circle of life around you, the, the people that you know. And I want you to ask yourself, I wonder if anybody's praying for them. I wonder if anybody shared their story. I wonder if anybody has invited them into a relationship, into a friendship. Because God wants to use you and I to be softeners of the ground so that when they hear the truth about Jesus, they're ready to respond. Quite often, people will accept or reject the idea of Jesus by who they know that claims to know him. And if they said, oh yeah, I knew a Christian man, he stole a bunch of money from me, or he you know, was one way at church and another way at home, it's hard to, it's hard to re- get them to respond to Jesus. But if they see somebody who really lived the life that Jesus calls us to, they might say, boy, I'd like to know more about that. We are to create the curiosity. We are the salt of the earth. We are to salt people's people's, uh, tongues so that they are interested in living water. Let's move on to the next part of the story. So then it says Jesus comes down to get baptized by John in the Jordan. And John has this strange moment like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Now, John and Jesus were not strangers. They were probably cousins, and at least they were closely related. And so they knew of each other. In fact, John already knew some of the stories about Jesus. But he'd been given a sign by the one who called him to baptize that said, the one on whom the Spirit comes, that's the one that you are to announce. That's the the Son of God. And so Jesus comes down to get baptized, and John's going, wait a minute, this is all wrong. I'm baptizing people because they're repenting from their sins. I know that you don't have any sin. And maybe we should switch places. Why don't you baptize me? And Jesus gave a very simple answer. He said, let it be so because this is to do what is right or to fulfill all righteousness. And so John said, okay. And he baptized him. And there's this incredible moment. It says, Jesus was coming up out of the water and he saw the heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. You see, Mark sets this up as, You want to know why I know this is the truth? Man, there was this incredible moment when Jesus kicked off his ministry, when the heavens were torn open. Isn't that literally what Jesus did? He opened the way for us. He tore away so that we could have a relationship with the Father. And there's also a beautiful clue in here This is one of the places where the Trinity all shows up in the same place. The Bible teaches very clearly that there's one God, only one God. And then it says, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And people go, I don't really get that. And I'll tell you, don't worry if you can't understand it, it, but believe it. That's who Jesus tells us God is like. And if Jesus came to tell us about who God is, then we need to believe him instead of trust our own thinking. So you have Jesus coming out of the water, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and then a voice that came from heaven saying, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. So what happens after that? At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. Now if you already didn't know the story, I don't think that's what you would have expected. Jesus comes down, he gets baptized, the heavens open up, and then what? He goes out in the middle of the desert for 40 days, doesn't eat anything, and Satan has full shot to tempt him. You think, wow, that's kind of a rough way to start your ministry. Well, well, I also notice that when, when people get baptized here, I usually challenge you to pray for them because... I've noted that when people take a step of faith forward, Satan reacts, and there is a temptation and a struggle that comes after that. But I think this is even deeper than that. Jesus is the perfect Son of God, and the Bible says that He was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. It's why He can be a a high priest who understands that when you and I pray, we have a sympathetic high priest. He knows what it's like. And Mark doesn't tell us anything about the temptation, but we know that it was a 40-day intense temptation, and he was presented with all kinds of offers, and it was real temptation. 
and yet he never sinned. You see, it's, it's a test not to fail, but a test to succeed. It's like when you have a, a cord or when you have a, an extension cord or a plug, it says UL listed or UL tested. What does that mean? That means it's gone through the test and proven to be safe, proven to be genuine. And so Jesus is proven to be genuine, not only by the baptism and the high moments, but by the temptation and the test and learning to stand. And, and he uses the word of God to stand against the enemy. So you see, in our lives, this is part of the testing process. It's part of the, the learning to obey in the middle of the mess. You know, sometimes it would be tempting to pull away and to go to a Christian commune or to stay only around believers and just be in this holy bubble. But God hasn't called us to live out of the world. He's called us to be in the world, but not of the world. So Jesus went through that temptation. And this was an important and critical part of not only what Jesus was being shown to be, but also he was establishing a pattern for all of us from that time on. So Jesus came down and he was baptized. He was, it was the beginning for him of his public ministry and the kickoff of who he was. But the scripture also calls you and I to be baptized. In fact, it's clear that there is this process of believing in Jesus and knowing who he is and coming to a place of surrender and commitment. And that can happen in all kinds of ways. You can pray quietly in your bedroom. You can pray here in a service. You can pray with a friend. But everybody in the New Testament that made a profession that they were going to follow Jesus, they got baptized in water because that was the visible symbol of what had already gone on inside of them. And so if you look at what's, what do we get out of that, you realize that Jesus came to get baptized. Can you imagine what a high moment this must have been like in John the Baptist's life? I mean, this is what he'd been preparing for and waiting for, and all of a sudden, here it is. And you know what happened to him after that? His disciples left and followed Jesus. He ended up getting thrown in jail. He ended up getting beheaded. This was like the high point of his life. This was his purpose. And you know, he lived this life and the time after it to the glory of God. And Jesus had high praise for John the Baptist because he did what God had called him to. So the question that I would put for you, and you can write this either way, so were we baptized? Or if you haven't been, you can write, so should we be baptized? And I know for some of you that's a wrestling match. And it doesn't mean you've arrived, and it certainly doesn't mean you're sinless. What it means is you are sincere in choosing to become a follower of Jesus. And if you haven't been baptized, we'd love to talk to you about that. We love to take people through that process because it's not only such an exhilarating moment for you, but it's also such a shot in the arm for all of the church family because we love to see people making that step of choice to follow Jesus. And then... What does he do after that? It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into the Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. You've been waiting for thousands of years. Now is the moment. And he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, Jesus probably preached for hours and somehow Mark cuts it down to about two sentences. What did he do? He said, the good news is here. It's the same word as the gospel, the idea that Jesus had come to set us free from the, the prison of sin that we are caught in. From the life that we are living, he has come to set us free. And it says, the time is now, the time is here. And he went proclaiming this, and he challenged them to repent. Change your minds, turn your hearts, follow me and you will hear the good news. It says that he went in the all kinds of, of cities around there, but one of the places where he settled was the town of Capernaum. And Capernaum was where it was kind of like his second home, his base of operations. And we've been there a number of times, and there was amazing uh, clarity when you look at how the, the archaeology has laid out the city of, of Capernaum. And that is where at least five of Jesus' disciples came from. And so what did he do after 
his day of declaration as a baptism, and then he went and he was tested in the wilderness, and then he goes out and he starts doing the ministry, teaching and preaching, but the thing that was going to last beyond him was he began to pick people to train. He began to pick people who you would have thought had no likelihood of being added to the club. So this is the town of Capernaum. It's right on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. And this is a synagogue that is from the 4th century, but it's built on a synagogue from Jesus' time. So when you're walking around there, you know literally he was in this synagogue, and this Catholic church is built over a site that they think was the house of Peter. And there were churches there from a very early time. And so how far is it from the synagogue to Peter's house? Yeah, it's just barely there, and you're right there at the shore. And this synagogue was where Jesus would teach and preach. It's where he did some of his miracles. And so the book of Mark makes it sound like he walks up to total strangers and say, come be my disciple. But they had been watching him. In fact, it's in the town of Capernaum that they say, don't we know his family? How could he be the son of God? And it may be that Jesus' family had moved to Capernaum. But they knew him, and then there's this moment when he chooses his disciples. And we know from the other Gospels that he spent the night in prayer, and then he went out and he found a bunch of fishermen. People that were uneducated, they were not powerful, they were not wealthy. In fact, most of the houses in Capernaum, you could touch both walls if you stretch your arms out. They're little tiny places. And it was a little fishing village. And it says... That Jesus saw some of these fishermen. And you know what he said? He said, those are going to be my apostles. They're going to change the world. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. So we've used this very simple idea to anchor what we call the definition of what a disciple is. A disciple is somebody who chooses to follow Jesus, to say, I believe that you really are the Son of God, and I'm going to get baptized and follow you with my life. And then they're in the process of being changed. You know, old foot-and-mouth Peter, who's a rough fisherman, is transformed to be the man who stands on the day of Pentecost and preaches a message of eloquence and power about who Jesus is. He's being changed by Jesus, and then Jesus invites them to be on mission with him, to be involved in this incredible venture of bringing the good news that the time has come and that Jesus is here. And our desire is not only that you become a disciple, but that you be in the process of making disciples. That just as Jesus chose people to train, just as he poured into people, So we believe that every one of us are called to be part of that same endeavor. And if you were here through the Commit series, we talked about the the lost secret of the American church. That somehow we've gotten the idea that church is something where you come and sit and watch the music and listen to a message and then walk out. And all of this reaching the world thing is supposed to be for elders and leaders and somebody else. And that's why we've tried to emphasize it's people helping people find and follow Jesus. It's every one of us, not only being forerunners for Jesus, not only giving witness to our belief in Jesus by being baptized, but God has called you to take what you have been given and to begin pouring it into the life of someone else so that they can pour it into the life of someone else, so that they can pour it into someone else. And you know what? He picked people just like you and me. He picked fishermen. So four of them were fishermen. The fifth one we'll catch next week is the tax collector, Levi, Matthew. And they're all from this little, tiny, insignificant fishing village called Capernaum. And if you were to find people that were going to be world changers, you would not have chosen this lineup, which I find very encouraging. It means that God loves to use ordinary people who have no eloquence or authority or power or wealth. 
They just learn to let Jesus fill us up, and then they become a part of being poured out into others' lives. So I hope as we walk through this book that you're challenged not only to believe more deeply that Jesus is exactly who He said He is, but that you ask yourself that question repeatedly, am I following Him? And how well am I following Him? I'm going to hand off now to our campus in Green and to South Umpqua, and we're going to conclude with just a couple of quick challenges. Maybe the question for you when you talk about following Jesus is this whole issue of baptism. Last time we had a baptism, we baptized somebody who was 90 years old, so I think that takes away the excuse that I'm too old. For those who are young, I like to see them be at least eight or nine, so we're sure that they understand what they're doing, so they don't come to really understand Jesus later and then have to get baptized again, or get really baptized. But if you haven't yet made that public declaration to be a follower of Jesus, let me ask you just to pray about that, and we'd love to talk to you about it and explore that in in whatever time frame you would like to. And then for all of us who say, I've already made that decision and I've already been baptized, let me challenge you. What is it that you need to do to follow Jesus? And I was thinking of this picture of the fishermen. Jesus said, follow me, and it said they left their what? Their nets. When the fisherman leaves his nets, he's done fishing. They, they were leaving their livelihood. They were, it says they left their father. They were leaving their town. And I will tell you that in the process of following Jesus, you probably have to leave some things behind. And for some of you, maybe that's the message for you today, is that God's saying, I want you to leave those things behind and come follow me. For some of you, it may be things that are hidden and secret and you're not wanting to deal with them. And Jesus said, follow me and I will make you, I will transform you, I will work in your life. And some of you may have been in the I'm just watching the show category of Christians. And maybe you need to say, okay, God, I'm going to leave my comfort zone. And I'm going to step out to begin to obey and to follow and to serve and to somehow be part of telling the good news about Jesus. And he doesn't call us to do it all the same way, but he calls all of us to be a part of it. And so I would encourage you to say yes. Whatever he's called us to, say yes. Father, thank you for these simple stories about Jesus that many of us know very well. But as we go back and review what happened and who you say you are and how you have proven yourself to be true, God, we, we come and we again bow and we say we worship you, we love you. Help us to follow you more closely. We want you to be our rabbi. We want you to teach us how to live life. We want to conform ourselves to you. And Father, as each of us have heard this message, I pray that you would share with each one of us by your Holy Spirit what it means for us to leave our nets and to follow you and to be your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.